pulling cords. There you go. We can share if we need to. Yep. Just share the whole screen. And... Perfect. Hey, sir. Hi. <laughs> I, I don't know if we, have, we don't even have an agenda. It's a workshop. It's a workshop. Don't wait. Get us going here. There we go. <laughs> Good. Well, thanks for coming tonight. Um, brief agenda of topics that we were going to cover this evening. And Stephanie's got a presentation to walk us through all of those, plus probably a few others. So I think there's going to be a lot of meat in the discussion tonight. So I'll just let you take it up. Perfect. Thanks, Amy. Um, yeah, so I will share my screen and Diane, just for you, feel free when, um, when I share my screen, I think I lose your visual, maybe not, but feel free to interrupt me at any point if you have questions, just because I won't be able to necessarily see you the same way. So, feel okay, free. thanks. I will. So, I'm going to just share my screen here and pull up the presentation, which you all have a copy of in front of you as well for those of you in person, but for our agenda here, we'll go through and do introductions again. Um, we want to give you a little update on what we've been up to since the last time we were together and then really kind of start to dig into some of what we've, the results of what we've uh, been doing in terms of um, existing conditions of population projections, which was really what was on this workshop for what we were going to talk mostly about. We'll get into the details of that and then some upcoming engagement activities and to round us out with next steps. So. Um, we understand that we're presenting information to you that you're seeing for the first time today, which um, in some ways is really great because it gives us a gut reaction um, to to you reviewing things and seeing things from that standpoint when we get to, um, and we'll talk about what what kind of decisions we need to make as we're moving through things um, here in the presentation as well. But we'll start with introductions. Go around just obviously your name and um, what your highlight has been so far for for 2022 what what makes what makes the month of january having been great so i will start we'll go around the room here so again stephanie folkers with srf my highlight so far for 2022 i have a 15 month old who is now walking and running and even going up and down the stairs with close supervision from mom and dad so that has been very exciting for me <laughs> Uh, my name is Patricia LaRue. I am the chairman of the Park Board and uh, on Plan Commission. And uh, for the first time in so many years, I because of COVID, um, I didn't get a lot of vacation days because we worked from home. And even when you kind of have a headache, you can work from home. But I finally hit my max is for the first time. And I don't think I've ever done this. I took, I had to take a whole week off at home with nothing to do, no vacation, no grandchildren, uh, painted some walls, organized some photographs, and um, yeah, that was last week with uh, Martin Luther King Day, and I added on a couple days, and I had my full week. Okay. I'm Rebecca Frendergast. I think the highlight for me, even though it's been really cold, it makes the warm days, warmer days seem that much closer to spring, so I think that's been great. <laughs> Even though 20 degrees is not warm. <laughs> <laughs> We're all crazy Wisconsin people, but when it's better than zero. So. so I'm Chris Olkamp, and I guess the highlight for me is I've got a couple of surveys out working, one for a research project I'm doing, and one for a comp plan update I'm doing for the village of Ellsworth. And we're getting lots and lots of good responses to those surveys, so I'm super excited about that. Um, Dan Holland. Um, my highlight so far. Uh, somebody said pink. Is that Patricia? Yeah, I think my highlight is I convinced. Wife started talking about remodeling stuff. I said, "Hey, I'll paint." <laughs> so let's do that, and we'll see if we do anything else. <laughs> and she bought it. So, well, so far, fingers crossed. <laughs> I got a little painting on. Say, they made a lot of money. So she sees this recording. That's a thing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Mike Moldy. I'm on the planning commission. I guess the highlight for me is I have uh, we sent our kids back out into the world after Christmas break. One went back to college, and then uh, my son went down to uh, Arizona. He's in AmeriCorps, and he's really liking what he's doing down there. And he's building some trails and having fun. And it's good to see them getting out and coming. Uh, 
you know, we're, we're on that road to empty nest. So <laughs> the kids are successful. What's AmeriCorps? AmeriCorps is a program that it's a smaller program by the federal government. I think it's funded through federal government where young people can go and um, there's different units within the United States. And if there's disaster relief recovery that needs to happen, they'll they'll send young people to go and do the work there or they'll do go to national parks and rehab trails. It's a CCC kind of thing. It is related. In fact, it's the AmeriCorps CCC, so it's, oh. it's connected. And uh, so there's, you know, all kinds of projects, um, and it's a really good program because students can, or young people can decide with, you know, where they want to go, what section of the country, and so. Cool. Uh, so it's, yeah. yeah. I'm Lisa Moody, and my highlight would be my first great grand niece. Oh. Uh, excuse, but the niece came out of the site, so January. Who's baby? Patty. Oh, okay. Patty. Yeah, Patty's grandma. Yeah. So exciting. And I'm going to do next month. So February just going to show. I'm Emily Shively, City Planner. And I have two. Um, I got a pair of running snowshoes that I can use at that white pitch. And they're, they're not as long. And these don't have the aluminum frame on them. They're one piece of like BBA molded and they're very parabolic. And they're kind of fun. So it's nice to go on the trails and know that I'm not getting it making foot parts of holes in it for the biking and stuff. So it again gets me outside on those like four months. Yeah. <laughs> um and my second one was we adopted a kitty. So we lost our 19 year old kitty last summer and just decided it was time to bring a new one on board. We've been super fun of the year old and just came into the world, into our household perfectly formed. He's sweet, he's behaved. I was like, really, what? what don't you have? <laughs> <laughs> no, he snuggles, he's a good eater, like all those things. So that's <laughs> really pretty fun. What's his name? Deuce. Oh. So we had Mercury, we lost Mercury. Now we have Deuce. Actually, Pluto. We'll <laughs> see. <laughs> he might be the playmate. So. <laughs> Amy Peterson, Community Development Director, and my highlight uh, was probably my husband's birthday in January. We didn't do anything exciting, terribly exciting, but it was good. So, yeah. <laughs> I'm Angie Bonin, Community Development Assistant. Um, my highlight um, in January was visiting our Marine son on his um, on his base. So kind of fun to see what his world is like. He's in um, Cherry Point, North Carolina. Brian was there. Was he? They call him wing washers. <laughs> I'll have to talk to him about it. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. And how about you, Diane? Um, uh, my name is Diane Odine. Um, and uh, I don't know, my, my highlight for January is, um, well, number one, that it's over. It's not my favorite month of the year, but um, <laughs> I've, I've got a daughter who lives in Colorado and just the other, just last night, I was able to arrange um, uh, uh, plane tickets for her to come and visit. She wasn't able to visit over Christmas because uh, her flight was canceled with, um, uh, you know, with all the COVID cancellations. So, and she um, worked for the Southwest Conservation Corps um, a couple summers ago, building trails in Colorado. So um, it's a it's a uh, great character builder. And she told me um, that it was the time of her life where she's felt the most self-confident and she thinks it's because she didn't have any access to social media. <laughs> so anyway, I'm looking forward to seeing her. Excellent. Thanks, Diane. Perfect. So we will keep uh, moving forward here. And the next item on our agenda is our status update. Kind of what have we been up to? And it's really been a focus in, in three different areas here in terms of um, looking at some existing conditions. And like we talked about at our last meeting, this is really um, our opportunity as kind of the outsiders of River Falls to get to know the community as well as all of you do, but then also start to build that foundation uh, for the analysis that we'll be able to do. What, who is River Falls now so that we can start to plan for who River Falls wants to be in the next 20 years. So we're going to go over a little bit of the information um, that we've pulled tonight and then also talk about who that River Falls is going to be, who are we planning for. Um, but then we've also been working on our engagement planning with Engage RF and our first um, open house and kickoff coming up. So we'll spend some time 
talking about that in the second half of our presentation on our time here tonight. And then we've also been working on planned branding. So wanted to give you all an update here on where we um, we ended up. We spend a lot of time with staff thinking about what kind of our tagline or phrasing should be. And this again is just for our planning process. This is not this branding was not intended to change anything. Um, you know, that the city has established, but it's meant to be that identifier for the comprehensive plan, the bike and ped plan, and the outdoor recreation plan. So, Focus River Falls is where we landed. We started, admittedly, with Forward River Falls and learned that the school district uh, had, uh, or an entity of the school district had taken that before we got there. But I'm glad, that, I'm glad that's the case. <laughs> it's not dream or envision, but it's close. Yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 yeah. it's like so weird. So, uh, yeah, so yeah, so the fo focus river falls is kind of our, the overall name for our entire planning process. Here and then we still have the three plans that are seated underneath this focus um, larger umbrella, um, and that's really meant to you know, again categorize and brand our overall planning process. We do have Engage RF, which is our online engagement platform, which we'll chat more about um, later in the presentation as well. So, kind of get used to hearing the words focus, maybe you know, focus River Falls, focus RF, and Engage RF are kind of be like going to be some. Common terms, uh, hopefully that will become a part of our vocabulary um, pretty easily as we're going through, but also wanted to call out that we, um, we've used some of the existing city colors to really establish and kind of differentiate the different planning processes. And so these are the logos that have been created for each of the individual plans in that yellow for that overall planning process. So um, wanted to call these out. These are, um, are in use and being used and, and things like that. So wanted you to see all of those components as well. Um, but then wanted to give you a quick update too on the other planning processes. Um, so to start out with the bike and pedestrian plan, they did have their steering committee kickoff at the beginning of this year. Um, and the exciting part with that steering committee is that is a um, all volunteer, they're not an existing Commission or group, it's a group of individuals in the community coming coming together. So that's um, an exciting piece there. And our um, sub consultant Alta is the one really leading the charge with this planning process. But they're working on that data collection piece and have already started to have a discussion of goals. That's really what they were focusing on at their first meeting with their steering committee and thinking about what kind of engagement and things they need to get um, at the beginning of their process as well. They are looking forward um, to where we've been having discussions about when is the right time for a bike ped uh, walking tour. Um, you know, when when are people ready to brave, uh, you know, being out for a tour in, you know, in the weather. So seeing from there, but just a quick update on that planning process. Just real quick, okay. um, for the, the that walking tour, is that going to be uh, just like one time event or are you going to be multiple of them? So, um, I don't, I'm not the perfect answer for this because Elta is the one answer, I, but I, I can't remember if they've got one or two, but we're the intent was that for that to be early in the planning process. We got started a, a little late with just things going on. And so, um, more to, more to come. Um, I certainly would love to see like the university. Yeah, I think we can. Sure. Okay. Because we have a lot of students without cars trying to get into downtown. And around, so definitely. definitely. Okay. Perfect. Sorry to know. No, that's okay. That's the the point of this. Feel free to interrupt me at any point. Um, and then from an outdoor recreation plan perspective, kind of in a same spot from that standpoint, we kicked off the steering committee um, and have been working on some data collection and existing inventory. So. All of the planning processes are kind of in this space of collecting that existing data and really looking forward to this first engagement 
that we're going to get that's really going to set the course for the next big phase of all of the planning process, which is really that analysis and um, goal and goal establishment and things of that nature. So, um, who is the steering committee on that? That is our outdoor. I'm going to the recreation. I forget their names. It's the American Rec Advisory Board. Advisory Board. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I forget the words that come before, but uh, before advisory. But um, so then from that moves us into our existing conditions and population projections, which was really what our goal of the meeting was going to be. And I think we've added just a little bit more meat for us to chat through here. But as we kick things off here, the existing conditions again is our opportunity to learn and gather information about what makes up River Falls today and the history behind that. So obviously, as we look at population change, demographic changes, we learn a little bit about the changes that made the community who it is today and who the people are that make up River Falls today. Now, this is a great thing for us to understand where we're coming from, but it, we also need to be think about thinking about where we're going. For when we're creating goals, we're not creating goals for who we are today here in, in on February 1st of January 2022, we are planning for the next 10, the next 20 years. So we need to be thinking about how our population is changing and some of those things. And that really gets us into the projections part of our discussion here. But again, the existing conditions is pulling that information that helps us understand where we're at. What we've pulled here today is just scratching the surface. We need to understand kind of a baseline of things and there's some standard things that will pull from a planning perspective. Obviously, understanding who, what our population total is, what are the age breakdowns of our population, what is our household income, some of those things. But by no means is this all of the data or analysis that we will do as part of the process. The next phase of gathering that community input is really going to tell us where we need to take a deeper dive. What are our goals and allowing us to dive in a little bit deeper? So. I just wanted to lay that framework in terms of what we're going over and what we're pulling is just the surface, but we need to start somewhere. So, um, but that does include um, looking at things across all of our plan elements. So if you remember, we've got nine required plan elements by state statute. So that's everything from land use to housing to economic development. Um, so this existing conditions, data gathering, goes beyond just understanding who our population is, but looking at what our what our systems are, what is our existing land use planning, what is our existing zoning, uh, so we have, again, that foundational basis for everything to be built on. This slide is just intended to show that we're, there's a lot of different things, you know, that we're looking at here. Again, when we look at land use, we're looking at things like what is our existing zoning, what are our um, TIF districts or our bid districts, where are those, what are those boundaries, so we just have that foundational information. We're not going to go through all of this here today because we would be here for you'd all need a big cup of coffee like I have. Um, but this is captured in an existing conditions report that we are doing the final review of with staff and we'll get this information out for all of you to take a look at. When I say that the, the intention of that review and comment again is not understanding that this is not. It's not a finished document in the sense this is a, in some ways a living document because we're going to build from it as we learn what analyses we need to pull. So it's again just our, our starting point. But we did want to go through some of the information that we've pulled so far and talk about what we're seeing. Um, and it's we understand that you're going to see a lot of this for, for the first time. And so we want you to ask questions or challenge us as we're going through some of these things. We wanted to chat through some of the data that we've pulled today. And then we're going to end this conversation talking about projections and thinking about who that population is in 2040 or 2045 that we are planning for through this process. So be thinking about that as we're, we're kind of going through some of this existing conditions information. The one thing I'll note here um, on the onset as we go through from what data is available right now for those of you that might be data nerds, because the 2020 census numbers were released, but there's not a ton, like there's not all of the information available for 2020. So you will note um, on these slides up at the top in parentheses, we've noted what year the information represents. So there are potentially some, for example, race information was released for the 2020 census, but age was not. So there's 
some little nuances there. So I just wanted to, for those of you that are, you know, maybe detail oriented, just that comment as well. So obviously we're going to start out with population growth. So here we've got our from 1990 to where we were in 20, 2020 with just over 16,000 people growing from that 10,000 back in 1990. The interesting part for me is the, the percent growth. Um, here we still had almost 8% growth over the last 10 years, which is, you know, still pretty, pretty good growth, but it's the lowest 10 year growth rate that we've had in 80 years as a community. So that goes back pretty, pretty far. Um, and of course, that's going to, you know, when you start with a population of 2000, uh, you know, 100%, it, anyway, as the population grows, that changes, but um, it is interesting to see almost 20% over the 20 years prior than dropping to that 8%, but it's still growth um, overall. I got a question. I don't mean to throw a curveball yep. out there right now, but when I look at those numbers, I also consider the kind of growth that is happening in the surrounding area. So this is inside the city limits, correct? But yes. Is there a way that we should be factoring in township growth up next to the city? where those folks use our resources and is that get factored in and so i just wanted to throw that out there because when i look at that number i think it could be a little skewed because are we counting those other developments tucked next to the or within a mile or two so yes yep and that's a really great factor and i bumped to this next slide because we do look at things from a larger region and i think there's there's an interesting way of you bring up a good kind of perspective of how we might look at that information because of course you know there's what we will be planning for in terms of you know future annexation areas and some of those things and how that gets factored into the to the mix here and then there's that balance and i think you know we've talked about it in terms of who we're going to engage as part of this planning process and you know they may be users of some of our systems but they're not taxpayers and so just trying to it's really it, that's a great point in terms of balancing that overall picture but how we factor and use that information is going to vary depending on what we're talking about. Right. So, thank you. Yep. Um, so, just a little bit more kind of history and background as we're looking at some of some things here. From a population growth perspective, we want to understand again that greater region. So, we're we're a two county community. So, of course, we're going to have to look at both counties from that perspective. And we also pulled the state of Wisconsin here. So, this is the percent growth, the change in the percent of growth. So we've got um, the first dot is our 1990 to 2000, the 2000 to 2010, and the 2010 to 2020 in terms of percent growth. So um, all four of the, the geographies that we're looking at here had growth um, you know, over that 30 year period, but that percent has fluctuated. And I think the interesting part as we look at this, obviously St. Croix County, we've been talking with Amy and Emily that that was the, you know, the St. Croix County in terms of the state of Wisconsin was booming with growth and things. And so, uh, but all of the geographies, it's interesting that they rose in terms of percent growth from 2000 to 2010, but then they all dropped um, for the for 2020. So that drop that we experienced from nearly 20% to just under 10% is not uncommon, you know, in terms of seeing that percent growth. Um, drop in terms of the other geographies we're looking at. They also have positive growth, but there's just that change there. We also looked at some of the surrounding communities um, that we, you know, so we didn't go to the township level here, but this is some of the other communities in the region that we look at. So in terms of Hudson and Yellow, Ellsworth and Green and New Richmond is the, the red brown. Um, same thing here, looking at percent change, they all had those same characteristics of a rise from the first 10 years to the next 10 years, and then a drop um, in the rate of change experienced um, into 2020. And then just what that looks like in terms of actual pop, the, the actual population over that um, 30 year period. Um, so River Falls being there in blue at the top with it Hudson, um, Ellsworth in green and New Richmond in brown, just a point of comparison. So again, all experiencing, you know, a growing population. Rates are a little bit different there, but just kind of understanding what's going on in the region. Mm -hmm. 
That's okay. <laughs> we're, we're fascinated by how Hudson is small. <laughs> So um, then we can look at other characters. So that's our overall population total, right? To just see what the, the grand numbers are there. But then we can look at some of the details and characteristics within uh, here as well. So this is a population pyramid that looks at the percent of our population in different age groups. So we start um, with under five years old at the bottom to 85 years and over at the top. And then we have our Male population in blue on the left and female population in green on the right. And so you can see that, you know, how these age groups vary. Obviously, the, our biggest group is the 20 to 24. Obviously, we are a university community. So that's not out of the ordinary for any university community to have those age cohorts uh, be the largest. It is interesting to me to see the difference in male and female populations from the 15 to 19, why the female population is so much bigger, um, you know, just kind of an interesting tidbit of where we're at. Again, these are 2019 ACS numbers. This is not 2020 census because that information has not been released. I don't know if that might be university enrollment because we're seeing, you know, was it like 60, 40? I, mean, okay. I think our university is is very much skewed female. Okay. Um, I mean, you know, just anecdotally walking around campus and in my classes that some of that might be, you know, College students okay. need that female a little bit to them. Yeah, definitely. And so, as planners, when we look at a population pyramid, we're look, really looking at what the shape of that pyramid is. If the if the pyramid is very you know bottom heavy pyramid shaped, that's tenor, usually indicative of a growing population because we have bigger populations in those childbearing ages, and so there's opportunities for for growth there. If it's if it's an inverse pyramid the other way around, we're probably we're potentially a declining population because the majority of our population is in those older age groups. Um, here we're kind of we have, you know the, the shape other than our we take out that outlier of the university population there we're we're not really made one more than the other although we are a little bottom heavy you know from that <laughs> standpoint. The one thing I will say about that analysis based on the shape is assuming that all of your growth is coming from people having children. And so that's not necessarily the, the best way of looking. It's just a, a general indicator that we can look at. The thing that I think is is interesting compared to some of the other Wisconsin communities or you know, any community really, is just that you're where your um, senior populations are. So if we again think about where our baby boomers are, and so there are some communities that are really grappling with huge huge um, spikes in those population groups. And there's a different service need as people start to retire and are looking for different housing options and things like that. So it's just kind of interesting to see, you know, how that shows up here um, for River Falls. So again, no right or wrong answer. It's just the information as it's, as it's laid out for us. Um, also looking at things like race, and this is something that, that, that is released for the 2020 census um so we were at um 89.4 percent white and then you can see the breakdown um over on the side I should maybe move diane here um so again just how that breaks out for those that are show up as individual races those are you know only one race if you are two or more races you get lumped into that two or more race um category there at the 5.3 we look at things like median and per capita income. So again, the difference um, between a median household income. So that's the average income for by by household versus per capita is that in overall income divided by the number of people, and just how that compares um, to some of our other populations or some of our other geographies. Uh, excuse me. So for River Falls in 2019, we had just under 60,000 for our median household income and a per app per capita income of 28,000. Um, so um, the lowest out of all of the geographies we looked at in terms of you know, the state, the US, and the, and the two counties um, from that perspective. Again, it's just, it's just the information that's out there. And some of that could pull because of the bulk of the university students. Definitely. So definitely, yep. 
Um, also looking at, you know, different characteristics of employment as well. And this is helpful to just understanding who our population is, but also looking at um, the fun element of economic development. Um, so looking at where workers live and where our residents are then employed. So, um, and really it's, it's kind of, it's all just right around that uh, a third and three quarters or a quarter and three quarters, excuse me, where we have uh, a quarter of our workers that also workers in the community that also live in the community. Um, and so then we've got, you know, three quarters of our workers generally coming in from other places and kind of that reverse happening as well that three quarters of our or just over 75% of our residents are also employed outside of the city of River Falls based on the 2019 ACS. Nope, this is Bureau of Labor Statistics. Um, I don't have our sources on here, but just it's interesting to see what that is. And so, you know, we look at what are our opportunities there from an economic development standpoint, but then also what does this mean from a transportation perspective as well? We do need to be mindful again of where these numbers are coming from as well in terms of 2019, we weren't in a global pandemic where people were working from home and you know some of those things. So there are changes um, and nuances with the, the information as well. Um, but then can look at things like our largest industries in terms of where, you know, what are where do we have more people employed and things like that. So 20% of our employees are employed within the educational service industry. Again, not, not surprising considering public school um, and then the university, healthcare and social assistance, accommodation and food service coming in at number three, retail trade with 10.4%, and then manufacturing at our 9% there. And these are jobs located within the community again when we're thinking about that. Thinking about things like housing and just some of our splits here. So, um, and this is 2019. I didn't get the, the date up there on the title, but 74% um, owner occupied in terms of the, the housing that's out there versus the 26% in terms of renter. And then just it's interesting to see with that people per household difference. That's not it's not uncharacteristic to have a difference uh, there, but just the number of People per household estimated in an owner occupied versus a renter occupied. See, that surprises me because I've heard time and time again, River Falls is about 50 50, and that's not even close to 50 50. Yeah, so this is just, um, well, that's, it, and this is a good part about having the conversation. This is the ACS estimates as they come out. There are some other data sources that we can look at and, and some of those things as well. I think there's how this gets categorized by the ACS is also. You know, could be a little off as well in terms of making some assumptions of you probably have, there's a lot of single family homes here that are renter occupied, which may yeah. not get categorized appropriately by the census. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, so it could be the type of housing, but it doesn't mean that. You know, yeah. So you're looking at apartment complexes versus single family dwellings. Mm -hmm. and, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think we're going to have to dig in first, you know, based on the data you're pulling now and dig into what's in the housing study because that shows about 50 50 and also with the commuter patterns that showed about 50 50 as well. So those commuter patterns that from the data that you pulled is showing a just, you know, difference there too. Yeah. So I think we'll have to dig in on those and figure out where. Okay, what that's looking like. And yeah. A smaller city, I know the ACS data can have pretty big margins of error as well. Yeah. So whenever you use that, you've got to be a little careful with it because it can be a little wonky. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is again ACS data. So just looking at the different unit, you know, different number of units, a different, uh, you know, how many of those types of um, housing units are out there. Um, so that was really our quick summary of what it's just a very quick snapshot of some of what we're looking at. But again, gives you the picture of the different types of things we're, we're starting to look at. We are also looking at things like, um, you know, the HUD ha or HUD has statistics for, um, you know, poverty levels and, and low income and some of those things. So looking at what those statistics are to help us understand, you know, that is helpful for us when we start to hear things like there's no affordable housing. Well, affordable housing 
is I love when I get the question of what what does it mean to be affordable because that's different to every single one of us uh, in this room and so to try to put a mark exactly on what that is can be a hard thing. The great part is HUD has a standard that is used that is used by housing authorities to actually define who is um, you know who can use some of those housing services. So that's a great benchmark um, for us and we have that information in our, our profile. So I'll maybe just pause there and see if anybody has any other comments or questions in terms of some of that overall information. With regard to affordable housing, is there, you know, you've said that they, there is a standard. Is it based on a percentage of income uh, used to, to pay for housing? Is that a standard by which we should be? Yes. Yeah. So typically, um, in terms of what the, if we were to say affordable to you should be 30% of your, your family's income. Should be that that's what the take home or is it, you know, free tax or is it, you know, whatever. Yeah. yeah. So you gotta make those kind of distinctions. Yes. Yeah. From a HUD standard, they set, you know, that, um, and then and that's based on median family income. And then it's further defined by by low income, very low income, and extremely low income, and what percentage those people make of the median family income as how as HUD has defined it, and then they further break that down. Whether you're a one person household, a four person household, an eight, per there's different standards for the number of people you have in your household. Obviously, if I have a sole income, and you know you have a, a married income, that there's different changes there. So. For those totals, for example, uh, low income for a four person family, as HUD defines it per the 2021 standards, is $80,000 essentially. Uh, but the extremely low income is um, making less than $31,000. So there are some breakdowns in terms, and that's based again on that median family income. So. Awesome. Okay. So then, again, we we're understanding who we are today, kind of the history behind how we've gotten here. Now we want to be thinking about population projections. Who are we planning for, um, and and uh, for the net for our plan for rise in 2040, 2045, You know, depending on how you look at that 20 year requirement by per state statute. So really, we're looking at. You know, pull out all of us, pull out our crystal balls, and trying to think about what that. What our population is going to be in the next 20 years and really what this is is a planning tool for us um, to make sure that our policies and resources that we have within the comprehensive plan support that growing population um, so when we're looking at things like land use it's making sure that we've identified enough growth areas to support so that that needed the, the housing that's needed the jobs that are needed to support that growing population. It's also a tool that can help us in terms of um, how much traffic we're going to have on our transportation system in the future or thinking about some of our utilities. I will note when it gets down to some of those system impacts, I, it, you'll want to, when it gets to the point of actually deciding if we need to upgrade a certain utility system, you'll do more study down the road, but this is at least our way to start a planning level estimate. I will note as well that this is the best. Yes, no one has a functioning crystal ball to know where we're going to be in 2045, but we need to have some kind of planning tool. Um, and so, you know, just putting that out there, there are also no requirements that say we have to meet. You know, there's there's no penalty if we put a population of whatever out there and we don't reach it in in 2040. There's no penalty. It's again just a planning tool. So before I stop and maybe ask for questions, I wanted to just highlight what is in the current comprehensive plan, the plan that you've been using um, in terms of growth. So in chapter, I think it's four, if I'm remembering correctly, um, there are projections that were, were laid out within the current plan. And I pulled, reorganized the data here a little bit, um, but they had population estimates for, um, 2000 to 2025 when that plan was written. Um, and so we had, they had estimated uh, 2010 population of 16,000, 2020 population of almost 21,000. So then you can see in green, 
where we actually ended up in terms of our census counts there. Um, and, but that plan did um, outline, you know, based on those population projections, what we would need from a future housing or from how many housing units we would need to support that population. Um, and, you know, some of those components um, within there as well. So that just is kind of goes to show where we, what we were planning based on the plan from 2005 and where we ended up. So again, we didn't quite hit those marks. There's nothing wrong with that. The good part is we planned for more growth than what we experienced. So we weren't tied because we didn't have enough tools in the toolbox to be able to, to go from there. So with all of that information being presented, I wanna pause and see if anyone has any questions about what the population projections are or or why we do them or anything like that. Or maybe Emily or Amy have anything to add to that with you. We have a finite area of land. So we've got so many housing. So when we're talking about all these additional housing units, are we taking taking out single family houses to build larger, more higher capacity residents? And in the same with commercial land acres, we only have so much. How much further can we go out? I mean, I guess we could annex, but um, it just seems to me that there's a point where we hit our, this is how much we can support. Yes, and that's something that, we, that's part of our planning process that we will be getting into is, you know, is looking at what actually do we need to do to support this growth? I can't tell, you know, that's, We'll need to find out what we want to suggest for policies and those types of things. So at this point, we want to be looking at what is our, where do we think we're trending in terms of history, in terms of a population, and then setting what those policies mean within it. Do we need to be adjusting our zoning code to increase the density of, res, you know, as new residential is coming in? Or do we need to be looking at what are our orderly annexation areas? Because in order to support this growth, we need to, you know, understand where we can grow and expand. Well, because Hudson's doing the same thing, mm -hmm. and you lose your small town. Um, this is where I want to be in a rural area. When we lose that seven miles of, mm -hmm. you know, farmland, and and to be able to drive through and see trees and all that kind of stuff, if everyone's kind of going like this, and no one's saying, okay, we have a limit, and this is our limit. Mm -hmm. Yep, and that's exactly why we wanted to have a conversation with you about this tonight, because we're not, we have, on my next slide, we have some, we've done some thought behind what, what is our, where, where do we want to be growing for the next 20 years? And so we need to kind of have a discussion about how you guys react to some of those numbers um, and what that means. And I think that's the interesting part when you look at the bottom half of this table is there was the current plan calculated out how many residential uh, acres of residential development, commercial development and industrial development is needed to support that growth. Um, and so um, we, we will, we've, cut, we've run those numbers a little bit behind the scenes uh, for the numbers we're about to, about to show you, but that, you know, we do look and think about, but there's a lot of things that change those numbers as well that are related to policy. So if we were to run the residential land acreage needs based on your current zoning ordinance, we may be, I didn't run these numbers specifically, but we may be average out at, you know, six units per one acre, let's just say. But if we wanted to change our policy and zoning ordinance to increase that, so we're, we're having higher density, now we've just changed our methodology there. And now, because we've changed our policy, we're then changing what development looks like. And so that's the game the game and kind of the activity and analysis that we will go through in this planning process. Did I hit that right? For yourself, do you use the projections or are you using like the state data center? Um, like I think the regional governments do projections. So, so we have started the DOA, we'll kind of jump right into it. The department, uh, the well, state DOA does projections that are used at a state and regional level. So for example, WSDOT uses these projections to run their statewide travel demand model. Now the downside is they, for whatever reason, haven't updated 
these numbers since 2013. So they're getting a little old from that standpoint. The really interesting part is when we take these numbers for River Falls, they were off on the 2020 population by eight people. <laughs> How they got that close, I have no idea, um, but they were pretty far off on St. Croix County. For example, they expected St. Croix County to go a lot more than the county actually did. Uh, Pierce County actually exceeded their, their projection for 2020. So obviously, again, these are demographers that, you know, are the biggest of the data nerds. Um, and so, you know, they got it right here in River Falls, but there's obviously, you know, there's lots of things that influence that. Of course, 2013 was almost 10 years ago. Now, at this point, we didn't ex uh, anticipate a, a global pandemic. We were coming off of the Great Recession. There are lots of different things that are happening that would factor into these numbers. But this is a state standard that is available for us to start looking at. So that is where we started looking at um, was what is out there for the DOA projections. And so they are, those projections only go out to 2040, um, but they project that River Falls will be just over 18,000 people by 2040. What's DOA? I'm sorry. The Department of Administration. Okay, thank you. Yep. Um, and so you'll notice here in this growth rate that they're not assuming that we're going to continue to grow, you know, this at the same rate, um, we're going to kind of start to taper off. Um, and like we had did over the last 10 years versus 20, starting to slow the, the rate in which we're going to grow. So that gives us something to, to start with, but then also gives us the opportunity to look at some other factors that are in place. So we've been talking about a few different things. Um, we did look at um, city administration, looked at the 2020 census number and made, you know, did some checking to see if that's, that was right and what that felt like. We've got our housing study that also does some projections. So there's some different things that you can look at, but we start to just look at some of the different history elements and what is out there to try to start to, to put some frame of reference together of what we might wanna use or be looking at in terms of projections. So we started with really just looking at what the DOA projections are, which when we think about that five-year growth rate, that varies. Again, they have different, they establish different growth rates for every five-year increment. Um, but then when we started to look at some historic things and just to see where things, um, where, where we got, we looked at a lot of different other factors, but these are kind of some good things for us to chat about here. So we looked at, we applied the growth rate that we just experienced over the last 10 years we applied the growth rate, the larger growth rate from 2000 to 2010. And then we also applied an average um, over that 20 years. Um, we had to take that down to five years because we're doing, we're projecting out every five years versus the 10 years that's experienced. So that's why you see a couple different numbers there. But again, this just gives us kind of a baseline to build off of based on actual things where we have just experienced within the community. Um, and we can get into it, but as we were chatting um, with Emily and Amy, there are some interesting things to think about in terms of what was happening in those 10 year periods. You know, the last 10 years we were recovering from the Great Recession. In the 10 years prior, you know, we were going, you know, at a hum and then the Great Recession hit. So there are lots of factors, you know, that influence things. Obviously, 2020, that census was taken during a global pandemic and some of those things. So again, all of our crystal balls are a little hazy from that standpoint, but again, gives us something to at least noodle on. So then we ran those projections and um, just to kind of come up with, a, with some totals here. Again, thinking back to the current comprehensive plan had us at planning for a 2020 population of 20,000, which isn't even what the DOA had projected us out, you know, by 2040. Um, so we just kind of, we threw off these numbers and to see where we would, you know, how they would stick and where we would get to. So we've got that um, 2000 to 2010 growth rate there at the top, getting us to almost 26,000 people. This is over the next 25 years. We did go out to 2045 since we're in 2022 today. Um, the yellow is then our 2000 to 2020 10 year average. So getting us in between there at 22,500. 
the last 10 years, um, getting us to just under 20,000. And then those DOA projections end up being the, the, the end of what we looked at here at 18,364. So we wanted to throw these out there and get your reaction. It is not our intent tonight to walk away and say that one of these numbers <laughs> is our magic number. We wanted to present this information from you and get your gut reaction for us to build from. We have started to pull some of these numbers and then apply that to what that would mean for a future housing need, how many housing units we would have to build to support this population, and then translating that also into um, potential acreage needs to kind of just understand where we're going. We don't want to muddy the waters in terms of presenting all of that to you, but there are some of these that align better in terms of like the number of build, um, residential building permits we're issuing on a regular basis. Some of these numbers do kind of align with, with where we were thinking from that standpoint. So um, again, maybe I will pause here quick and see if Amy and Emily have anything to add before I turn it over to everybody else. You know, we'd like to hear the discussion. Okay. That's hard to, that's hard to grab. I mean, like I said, every 10 years things change so much. I mean, from 2007 to 2015, People weren't moving. They, they didn't have the money to do it. Now from 2015 to now, things are starting to heat up again. And well, you know, inflation keeps going up. We know what's going to happen over the next 10 years. I mean, housing prices get ridiculous again. So people are going to start just staying where they are and remodeling what they got. Are we, I don't in, know. are we in the second year of, a, of uh, when we're getting a growth rate of the United States in general is, is in decline. It's decline. Yeah. So and I think that's a big factor in, in, in that. And that's why I would kind of hang with the low numbers. Yes. Uh, the 19 or even, you know, say 20,000 by that far out. And then I guess one of the, where my imagination goes is, is um, industrial development or um, We've talked about the fact that River Falls, you know, we have the possibility of taking on perhaps a larger industry that could come in. How does that translate into, you know, what's, you know, say there's a, uh, a company decides to put one of its branches or its headquarters just outside of town because there's, they, we have the, the ability to do it, just imagination. What does that translate into workers living near that or does it doesn't matter not as much as you think because those people would be commuting to river falls kind of like they do to the university so that's kind of where my imagination goes and and uh, is it even a factor to consider when we look at commercial development and a big uh employer company yeah and and how how should i be thinking of that i guess it's kind of where i want to find what yes and i think you we have to that is there when you think about how the population grows that happens in you know many different ways in terms of the overall birth rate and you know people of course there are lots of trends people are having less kids household sizes are different whatever but that is only one factor of how a population grows or changes then there is also the migration in to a community and those factors like a new business coming in and where are those people going to locate because we are in the location we are in, it's really hard to say what, how that influences us. I will take, you know, Madison is kind of in it. I'll use Madison as another example. Madison is in a different spot because they're kind of the regional hub. There's, we've been involved with some traffic studies for some, you know, bigger employers coming in in the Madison area. And you can generally assume where those people, the, a larger percentage of those individuals are going to live. It's a little different to kind of try to figure out, you know, some of that in your bank, you have to make some assumptions on trends. When I started my career in planning, we were saying that the, you know, millennials don't, you know, they want a certain thing. They don't want, you know, these large lot homes. They don't want to, they don't want to own, they want to rent. They're not, they're only going to have maybe one kid or no kids. And so we were making assumptions off that now that millennials are in their thirties, We've got some, you know, I'm a millennial, I live on 13 acres and I have one child. I'm not fitting that mold in which 
I was planning for, you know, when I started. So there's that that's where it comes becomes a little bit hard of a of a guessing game from that standpoint. But that's where we need to be. We want to think of from my standpoint, think a little bit on the higher side again, because that gives us the flexibility in our planning tools. We don't want to be caught in a spot in five years where you have experienced tire growth and now you're having to update your plan because we didn't assume or we didn't plan for enough growth, you know, from that standpoint, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, but it's just, you know, kind of what some factors there. So not that history is always the path forward, but when we've had those bigger employees come in, can we look back and see trends um, that have happened in River Falls if we've had a certain amount of you know, size company come in? Do we see those kind of trends in River Falls like as an indicator moving forward? Not that that's the only point to use, but just do we see that? I don't know if the data would be finite to see those small blips. I don't I guess the one that's well, for me would be in Hudson, maybe when I look when I drive by or U line, for example, and I imagine I don't know how many of the people they're employing there, but did was there a significant growth in Hudson well when a facility like that yeah. went in, I guess. It makes sense. Uh, can I can I jump in here a second? Yeah. This is this is Diane. Um, you know, a, another thing the, the, our, our big employer is the university. Um, and the school districts. So, um, you know, some of these numbers depend, I believe, on on how vibrant the university stays, or if it stays. Um, uh, it and the university has been stagnant and declining in enrollment over the last ten years, which is, I think, part of why our growth stalled a bit. So. Um, you know, if if the university, um, you know, gets revitalized with a new science building and, you know, maybe some uh, new state state policies that actually invest in it, um, I think we'll grow faster. But um, if if it goes away, we are not going to grow. Yeah, to Diane's point, I think we're down eleven hundred students just in the last year. I mean, since I've been like not very long, it's not my fault. I swear. It's not my fault. <laughs> it's, it's kind of terrifying, actually, from my perspective. Um, but yeah, I mean, the university enrollment is is declining significantly, and I mean, you look at trends nationally. You know, I don't know that that's going to change. Right. Um, to Diane's point, maybe like the new side tech buildings and new new programming might might help, but that's a big lift for for that. So. Right, and and our our other employers, at least the ones that have come in so far, are so small compared to. Compared to the university, um, so anyway, that's 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 what I think when I see when I see these numbers. It's like you know, they, I I think the range looks right to me, but um, you know, a lot depends on things that we just can't know right now. And then one of the concerns with with over planning is you know if we put ourselves on the hook for our, you know a major wastewater expansion on the assumption, then we're like, oh crap, we've got to pay for this. Wastewater plant that we don't actually need. Right. And so you, I mean, I get this. This is one of those tricky things. You've got to walk that fine line of planning enough, but not so much you dig a hole, a financial hole you can't support. Yes. Yeah. Mike, back to your question about a big employer coming in. I think back to the slide that shows um, the people that are working here and where they live. You know, so we know that half or three quarters, yeah. depending on the data, you know, work here, but they don't live here. So are there, is there a shift that we want to make to provide, you know, residences for those folks, should they want to live here? And is that, you know, policy shift that we can make as part of this plan? If so, and that's one consideration. Yeah. And that that's a really great point in terms of. We have the forethought and planning that comes in in those things as well. And I, you know, I don't know, for example, you line what the like um, wages are for, for to use Hudson for an example. But a lot of times, the hiccup that you have with a new industry coming into town is that you have how available housing that's at a rate that that employer provides as well. And so sometimes, if you're thinking 
bigger manufacturing, a lot of times communities probably have the housing stock to support the executives or higher level employees in that type of facility, but you struggle with some of those. And then you're creating a bigger issue about a new employer that doesn't have employees to support their business. And so there is a big policy, maybe bring the real good point, that the policies and planning that we put in place are really connected in terms of you know these systems. Well, there's also the, this, the other challenge as well. I, mean, I was working in a, in a city in Texas that landed a 600 employee manufacturing plant and paid really good wages. And for this town, it's really good wages. But most of the people who were going to work there ended up living somewhere like 45 minutes away. One, because there wasn't a lot of available housing because the population had been stagnant, but also because the available jobs for spouses and stuff weren't in this community. So if you're a two income household, your your spouse's employment is also going to potentially influence where you live. So it, it is really hard to, to get to that point of like, if we land a 500 person business, what will that do our projections? Yeah. Right? It's, it's, it's all it's it's not, it could be just mark it all. Yeah. And, and, you know, that's you know, the quote Mark Twain, it's lies and lies and statistics. So <laughs> Yeah, as far as the, the university is concerned and yeah, the future that I, I like what uh, Diane's talking about there. Um, I'm optimistic right in the immediate future, just from the information I'm privy to it looks like, you know, there's interest is coming back and that kind of thing, just based on what I'm seeing and I'm hoping we're going to stop the uh, kind of the, the decline there this in the near future. But the other thing is part of that is, yeah, there's, you know, we're going to have this decline perhaps across the state, across the region with college enrollment. But that puts things into a, a, a university like ours in a, you know, we have to be competitive, more competitive with a marketing, you know, direction, that kind of thing. And we're going to have to. And, and what I've seen right now is we're working on that on campus that will help. You know, ho hopefully maintain that, that enrollment. And as other options kind of maybe our competitors are declining with their certain programs, we can strengthen ours and bring people in and stop kind of that, that hemorrhaging a little bit. And with this, with the leadership that we have, the new leadership right now, I'm seeing that, you know, they're forward thinking, you know, brand platform upgrade and that kind of thing. So that's what I'm seeing in the immediate future. And, and I think you, you said you mentioned something about looking at kind of comparing this data to um, some of the building permit stuff that's going on. So I mean, you look at you know even the projects we've seen coming through here, right? I mean, what, what we're building in River Falls, there's a lot of you know there's been several apartment complexes, like the townhomes there on the cemetery and the mixed housing kind of on the east side of town, and obviously the new stuff we just talked about last time up in the what is that development up there? Dawes. Hmm? Dawes. Dawes, maybe, or the one where the road, the, the U shaped road we just approved. Yeah, that's yeah. the one. Yeah. 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 Early Pond, that's the one. Yeah, <laughs> Dawes, whatever. Right, so a lot of that's in duplexes and, and mixed housing. So, you know, that's certainly going to drive a lot of what we're going to see as well. If we're building more dense housing, that, that might help push us more of that kind of higher end of these projections as well. And there, like I mentioned too, there are the housing plan, for example, that only projects us out to 2030. So not quite the horizon that we're looking at here, but that projected a, uh, 832 new units by 2030 based on the 20, I think it was 2017 that the numbers are pulling from. So that's 64 units per year at an average of 2.7 people per household. Which is a little higher than what we're at. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, is 173 new people per year, which doing the math, that would get us to a 2030 population of 18,000 people based on the, that housing study. So, you know, that in terms of using, comparing that to the DOA projection, so that the DOA, the DOA is a little short compared to where the housing study would put us. Um, so there's lots of different factors to put into play you know, when you're you're looking at those different things. And so again, this we're not expected to walk away by saying that the 2020 or 22,000 is the number that we're gonna go with, but wanted to to just get this in front of you and get talking about what how these 
these feel and, and some of those things. I will admit in terms of even aligning with that 64 new units per year as averaged out in the housing plan, the um, 22,000 and the 19,000 projections put us on either side of either more housing growth or just a little less housing growth than what we've been experiencing or what the housing study is estimating. So just to put that into a, a frame of reference there based again on that, that average people per household um, number, which of course has the potential to change another factor in, in all of our assumptions that will influence things here as well. Well, I, I'd like to comment on the senior. We talked a lot about the college and the families, but the senior population, I think is more consistent, more you get in your house and you choose River Falls and you buy your house and that's where you're gonna stay. Where if you're a growing family, you might buy this house and then sell that house and go to another house and, and you're moving around. But I, I, I don't even know where I'm going with this comment, except I'm, I'm thinking of the people I know, the empty nesters, well, you get a nice house where you like it, and you're not going to move for 20, 30 years. I mean, that's your house. You're hopefully not going to end up in a nursing home, and, and you'll have daycare, you know, not daycare, but health care at home, and that's where you'll be. And there's only two of you, where, like my son's house is probably about as big as mine. There's five living there. There's only two in mine. Sure. So you could basically make a prediction easier on that demographic over the, the many years that we're looking at versus just the people I don't know the people my age in my group yeah. they're not looking at well I'm going to buy this house for five years and I'm going to look for a bigger house or a smaller house or right. well maybe an apartment but right. um but yeah I think they're more more consistent mm -hmm. Is there any data out there on mobility in terms of age range? Yes, and you know, I think there's there's part of using this generalized data and then trying to apply it to a community as well, because I think that I, I align with your comment in terms of like, once you get in at a certain age rate, wanting to stay in that spot, but I think there's other part, other data would show that when you become an empty nester, that there's a trend of downsizing. You're not going to stay in your, you know, in your big house. Yeah, not your big house, but you want the Sterling Ponds type of development where it's all on one level, it's more accessible, and some of those things. So that's, but that's not, that's a, again a generalized characteristic. It might not be true to River Falls. And so that's where we've got a lot of these different factors on either statewide, regional, or, or nationwide trends that have to then be factored in and how does that feel for us here, you know, in River Falls and again, trying to think about, you know, where I'm going to be in 25 years. <laughs> is it a good idea? And again, my imagination is, you know, what, what with, with climate change and migrations of populations that, that we look like a promising region for people who want to get out of a drought stricken area and that kind of thing and how much uh, how much is that a factor to be considered if those kind of migrations happen over the next two or three decades? Yep. And that's definitely a factor from a national perspective when we look at the Midwest that we're expect, you know, people from our, our coasts are moving inward to get away from some of those things. And so, you know, we will see. Well, this, this is the problem of doing, trying to do a 20 year plan. Let's be honest. It's ridiculous to try and ex think about 20 years from now. So, I mean, I know we have to do it because that's like the state requirements and yeah. all of that, but for reals, we need to, you know, I would focus more on the next five years, really pretty detailed. And after that, we get into sort of like, well, we'll kind of think about doing this, you know, because I mean, within five years, we're going to have to revisit this and, and update it, which should anyways. I mean, I don't, I don't know if this city would do that, but. I would hope the city would take a long, hard look at this within five years and reconsider all of this. I guess, yeah, that's a question I have. You know, we're doing this now for that, but is it a rolling activity that you do about every five years and you update it? And so when you get out past those 10, that 10 year mark, it is your imagination and you can kind of put what you want in. Exactly. You can it for a yeah. In a way, I think so. And that's again how this 
how this document is used. State statutes say that we're supposed to update this every 10 years, you know, in terms of the requirement, but it, it's also a living document. So you can update it at any point and change components. Say if your employment employer comes in, we look through the plan and say, well, what is this about? Yeah. Right? When you have a storm that breaks the dam and you can't refill the lake, what do we look at today? Right? So, yeah, the intention is it should be yeah, looked at a lot. Yes. Is what you hope to write by inside of your stop or something, which they sometimes do. Yeah. But I yes. expect that. Really. <laughs> the other thing is how you use and reference the data because the, you know, the one thing that I, for me, really becomes how we use this population projection is making sure that we have the growth policies or land use policies in place to support that growth. So, in terms of having a future land use map that you can all use as you're making zoning decisions that we've already gone through and assessed where we want to see that growth occur in the community. So, you have that as a tool in the next 5, 10 years, you're going to update that plan, you know, 10 years from now. So. Anything we do beyond that is just kind of, you know, something to be thinking about in the future. Now, using this for something like a, you know, projecting wastewater treatment upgrades, that you're, you can maybe look at this to say this is what we have planned for a future land use perspective, but you're going to do a whole lot more studying in terms of what your needs are. I would be very surprised if somebody used, you know, a number like this. Or that you're going to understand where you're at in terms of the current population and users and, and those things. So it's also about what how this data is used. So again, it's 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 fun to like get in and really think about all of the pieces of the puzzle to get us to a number, but really we, we need to stay a little bit higher level and just understand what kind of makes sense, what do we think is what kind of feels right, and then just again understanding how this tool is used within the planning document and how it's used by, by staff and decision makers moving forward. And I think also just recognizing the DOA numbers are the official state numbers that influences things like when we go for grants or we go for transportation projects, the state's gonna look to their own numbers with the official numbers. So we don't wanna get too far away from those, I wouldn't think, just because you know, we're coming in saying we're going to be 25,000 people. Or, you know, you're nuts. Yeah. Our numbers are entirely different. You know, it just tosses out. So I would be more on the side of like the DOA is closer to that number, maybe, than, than anything else, just because that is the official state numbers. And hopefully they'll update it soon and we'll have better data. Yeah, they are working on it. We are working with the state on the travel demand model. So we have an inside route. if. But we've been tell, saying that for like the last five years that we haven't updated it. Cars, and, yeah, and they they still haven't updated it. But uh, but yeah. So I think just looking at time as well. I wanted you know we can. I'm happy to have more conversations and things. But I think this has been good just to kind of get that gut check um, again from what you guys are thinking, and we'll you know continue to move things forward from that standpoint. But want to be respectful of your time as well. Um, so I just that's yeah. Um, okay, so then that gets us into our um, upcoming engagement activities and wanted to highlight a few different things for you here. The big pieces are yeah, it's kind of two different components here. We've got Engage RF, which is our online engagement platform, and then we have our in person open house. So this is a two fold. Um, Twofold um, activities in terms of our kicking things off with the public. Really, what the purpose of this part of the process here is kind of threefold um, in the way that we're looking at it. It's informing the public of what we're doing. What is this focus, River Falls? What are we doing? Letting people know that the city is planning for the next 20 years. Um, educating them on what does this include? Why is this important to the public? Why should they be a part of the process? And then very importantly, it's learning from the public through this process. What are their experiences? What are experiences? What are their challenges um, that they have in finding housing or using different modes of transportation, um, different things of that nature? So that's really the, the three things that we're looking to do through this initial phase of engagement. And the thing to remember here is obviously we've got the overarching comprehensive plan, but we do have the bike ped plan and the outdoor recreation plan, which Will also the, those processes are also informed from this 
initial uh, any phase of engagement as well. Everything is tied together there. So, um, in terms of kind of our timing of engagement, we did launch the Engage RF platform today. So hopefully you all got an email and we're maybe able to sign up uh, for that platform right now. It's got some baseline information out there, but really looking at that informing and educating part of what our goals are of this process. So it's really kicking things off. There is, um, and maybe I'll just at this point pull open. So maybe you have had an opportunity to take a look, maybe not. It's a pretty easy URL, engagerf.org. Hard to mess that one up. Just like there was some email, I asked Kendra this, and she said it's because the Engage RF is going to be probably ongoing. But I was wondering why it's Engage RF and not Focus RF to match the brand new that's not planned. Just again, <laughs> can't take you out being a turd, but just had to ask. It, it is because. Um, we had contemplated this tool prior to the comprehensive plan, decided to use it as part of the planning process as kind of a test run to see how it goes. Mm -hmm. If we like it, the city can keep it and use it as other projects. So we debated that, but decided yeah. to use a, a more generic term that could be used long term if we want to. Thanks. Yeah. No. Sorry. I'll shut up. Yeah. <laughs> Nope, it's it's a great point because yeah, we are introducing two terminal, you know, two different things from that standpoint. But um, right now, it is focused on focus River Falls on our planning process with that opportunity to grow and change. You know, as if there's some other study that's going to be done down the road here. Um, so when you go to the URL, you'll land on kind of what is this overall plan that we're doing. There's a welcome video. The mayor's got some great. A great piece there in the video. Um, and then there are um, pages for each of our plans that are going on through this process, the comprehensive plan that you're the steering committee for and our two others. And you can um, go to those pages to learn more information um, about what's going on in terms of what is the comprehensive plan, how is it used, what does it include, those types of things. The great part about this tool is that we've got opportunities for engagement built right into the website. Um, the one thing is this does require people to register um, in terms of, you know, really being a part of this process. The great part in the way we've tried to phrase it in terms of promotion is you are becoming part of our team as you're registering and becoming a part of Engage RF. Um, so that also gives us a platform to send emails to individuals to say we've got something new coming up or so the intent is that we're using this site throughout the entirety of the planning process and we don't have to hold a big public meeting to ask people, you know, a certain question. We, we've got this tool and platform available to, to ask things. So really it's, I think there's the opportunity that we always have some kind of engagement or activity going on in this site for when people, you know, come and find things. So, um, so there's that piece to it. Um, the other piece, we have our previous steering committee. Somebody can go and watch what we talked about, you know, from that first meeting. We've got who's listening. Um, and with that registration piece as well, we do get some statistics about people that are signing up if they're willing to provide them to us. So that's another great tool um, if we want to specifically target a certain age demographic or things like that. We can, if people have provided those demographic information, that demographic information, we can send an email, specific email out to any community members under the age of 30. Um, really, the way that we formulated those questions was to get at, you know, some of your initial concern of who is providing that input for us. And, or, and so then that way we can look, there is that initial question of how, how are you a member of the community? When I created my profile, I am a visitor. And that was the only thing that applied to me as a resident of the Twin Cities Metro, I'm a visitor. So if I was to go in and put input, I can see how just visitors responded to a question versus those that live here, those that work here, things of that nature. Well, and I signed up and one of the things that I noticed when you answer the questions, it's like, if you don't decide, I don't want to tell you my age, then don't complain when we don't have the program for you. If you don't want to give us your income, don't complain that we don't have, you know, mm -hmm. we're trying to, we're not trying to dig into your personal life. We just, who are we talking to? Yeah. Are we talking to people who all make under 30,000 and we need to work with that? Or 
Yeah, because I'm like going, people are going to balk at this, but I'm going to tell the people I send it to, if you don't want to answer those, fine, but then don't complain <laughs> that we didn't know right. who we're dealing with. Yeah. Yeah. So, and we'll get, I've got a slide later about how you can kind of help us with this, but any questions on kind of this engage our platform or any other experience? Is all this information you're gathering going to be made public? So someone who wanted to see what the responses were, maybe check us to say, mm -hmm. you guys kind of hijack this because this is what, okay. Yep. Good. Yeah. Thank you. So through that process, we will remove and hide anything that would reveal personal information or things like that. But we're also not, we don't ask questions with the intent of knowing that, you know, Sally makes $100,000 a year and because she makes $100,000 a year, she can't, doesn't have access to X, Y, and Z. We're not going to ask those types of questions, but we would remove, if Sally commented that in a comment box, we would remove, you know, Sally's name and those types of things. So. Um, we do protect personal information, so we're not, we don't try not to ask it in that way as well. So would this tool allow like users to upload pictures? Because I know like that's pretty common where you know, you're like, because everybody's got their phone with their camera now. So like if you're out and about and you're like, hey, I see a crappy sidewalk, like take a picture, post it here and say like, here's a problem, right? And here's an accessibility issue. So is that a, a possible through this tool? Yes, so that's uh, we wanted to highlight what some of the tools are available to us. So right now there are surveys up on the site, but there's kind of three different formats of engagement activities that we have available through Engage RF. There is our, and I just pulled their term of the terminology from the, the table. So, um, but there is an open environment which allows people to interact with other input. That's out there. There is a mixed environment where I can see what Lisa commented, but I can't interact with Lisa. And then there is our controlled environment where you submit a response and it's closed and nobody else can, can see it until we would pull an overall summary. So I wouldn't know specifically what Lisa said. I would know what we all said, you know, Lisa's contribution to, to the whole from that standpoint. And so there are some different tools as part of that. And it depends on what we have out there. Um, our stories provide us a little bit more flexibility in terms of the input that people, the form of input that they can provide, whether that's a video or a written narrative, a picture, some of those things. Um, the places, for example, is a map where you're literally dropping a pin on a map to say that this is an area that I have, you know, there's poor pavement or, you know, this is a crossing that my, you know, six-year-old can't make on their bike, you know. Some of those things. So, in terms of our open environment, um, the forum and ideas are kind of we're asking a question that you can comment on. The forum allows us to interact. So, if Amy says, uh, you know, I love to go have lunch or whatever in X, Y, and Z, I can say, oh, I love that too, you know, whatever, something we can comment and build from each other. The ideas would be a question where, you know, we want to know your general answer and I can give a thumbs up or a thumbs down to Emily's response to her favorite, you know, place to go shopping in the community. Um, and then the places again is that we're dropping pins until you can comment on other people's comments and add your own. So it's nice because we can kind of interact from that standpoint. The only information that's put out there is what their username is. So for example, I did my username as step F because why not? You could have been, you know, engaged River River Falls could be your username and that's what would pop up as your identifier as well. From that mixed environment, again, our stories, guest book and Q&A, I can see everybody's responses, but I can't comment on them. So this just is some different tools there. The guest book is a little kind of silly because it's, again, just who kind of was, who saw the information, but stories allows us to have a little bit more information and input in terms of what is your story or your contribution. The Q&A is exactly what it is, the Q&A. And then our quick poll and surveys are pretty self-explanatory again from, from that standpoint, but it's the surveys in particular are our way to ask more questions all at once. That is the one tool that's available here where we can have, you know, multiple, you answer multiple questions versus these others are kind of, you know, a one activity and move forward. So it is our intent to utilize a variety of these tools throughout the planning process. So you will see 
you know, there might be a forum up on the comp plan and a place up on the bike pen plan and a stories up on the outdoor recreation plan. And those are changing as we go through different phases of this process as well. So that's kind of what's out there for us. The cool part and the way that we're looking at this tool is that any, any engagement that we have in person, you also have the opportunity to interact with that in some form on EngageRF because either people can't make, make it on the 24th from 2 to 7 p.m. or they're not comfortable attending something in person with COVID, things like that. But it's also great because this is a form for us to, again, not have to have something in person if we want to just test an idea or things like that. It's a captive, already engaged audience um, for us to engage with. And so that's where we really would like as many people to become a part of this. There is an incentive right now for anybody that signs up by the 24th will be put into a drawing for 25 bucks of chamber checks. Um, so there's some you know incentives and some ongoing incentives that we'll be doing beyond this as well, but just kind of that initial incentive there as well, which should have, which is that statement is in the email that you guys got from Amy uh, earlier today. Is there, is there an age limit on this? I guess, I mean, like for, I mean, for like kids or anything to get on there? I mean, I, I don't know that they probably would, but I mean, what, I guess, would there be a way to kind of have the like kids section on this maybe to try and like if we did like a classroom activity with, with one of the school rooms, maybe not an unfettered access, but could we do something where we have like a specific kids activity? So like at the time, maybe at the open house, we could have like if people come with their kids, there could be something through this that could be like, hey kids, go tell us what you like about River Falls. So we can get a little bit of that perspective from from a different audience or it's I, I don't know. It's just well, because in 25 years, they're the one that's going to be the ones living with the decisions we make now. So. Way to get their, their parents, the adults. Join in if there's something that engages it. And yeah, they're 25 years from now, they're going to be looking at what we've done. We'll have to look at it. <clears throat> so I didn't read the fine print on the terms and conditions that you click when you register. My okay. guess is that it says that you're, you know, over 18, right. but I'm not positive. Yeah, yeah. that's what makes sense. I mean, I, I'm just thinking in terms of not an unstructured, like kids can just sign up and go play on it. I mean, like if we're doing like an open house or we're having, you know, again, like a classroom setting where it can be a little bit controlled and structured, could we set up something through this platform to capture that easier than like, we're just gonna have a room where the kids go, like they can draw pictures and write on them. You know, we could do engagement with kids, but I'm just thinking like with this, it might be an easier way to do that. Again, in that sort of controlled setting. This seems to be to the, excuse me, the corner project and they can, I mean, they interacted, they, they got to, you know, draw things or, you know, this would be fun to do and it, it, it got them involved and it got the parents interested in, you know, just the thought process. And it makes it easier to grant them the open house because they will take your kids and I'll do something while you're, you know, going through the open house. Yeah, it's getting a twofold. Just yeah. I, I, I really know y'all are going to hate me for this. Nope, but Alicia Miller, she has a group with the, the grade school kids, and they have a whole thing on, on renewable energy and turning lights off and not running the water and conservation and stuff. And, and they go and they play games and they win points, mm -hmm. and it's really cool. They get involved in that. Yeah, so I think there's a couple ways with that that age limitation and kind of that signing up thing does put us in a little bit of a gray area in terms of like how kids could interact. I think this platform could be used in a way where we could target something to say, hey, you know, hey, parents or hey, you know, adults that interact with children. This this activity is aimed for you to engage. You do this with your children. Right. That um, yeah. That yeah. Um, I think there are lots of different ways that we can look at, you know, we've got pop up events and some of those in person activities where we have the, the opportunities are out there for us to do a lot of different things from that standpoint. But, um, you know, I think it's just kind of tailoring things. For sure. For sure. Yeah. So yeah, you have to be real careful with kids. I understand. Yeah. So. Yeah. So, um, we just wanted to kind of give you an overview there again and again, there is. 
engage RF has the opportunity to grow into, you know, other things as the, the city needs. So it may, it's going to stay the way that it's formatted uh, until there's something else that pops up. Um, but um, the, that front page does also identify, you know, who is listening as part of this. So um, we encourage you as steering committee members to get onto that site. Um, you are open to participate and provide your input as well, but it's really an easy way for you to go on and especially in the open and mixed environment for you to see and interact on, um, you know, what, what we're hearing throughout the process as well. Um, so in terms of really, you know, a little bit of an ask for you, I think when we talked about our roles and responsibilities at the first meeting, we need your help uh, from a promotion side of things as well. So that we've got five different things laid out here, but the first, and maybe you've already done it, is creating that engage RF account, you know, go to that site, get logged in, um, sending that e-blast that Amy sent on this morning to your friends and family. You have networks within this community that we don't necessarily have access to, and so we would love your help um, from that standpoint, getting the word out. There will be, there are posts that have been so, posts on social media, Facebook particularly, that you know talk about not only engage rf but the uh, upcoming open house and things sharing those on your platforms or if you're a represent if you are connected to a certain organization and we can get the organization to share the city's post on their platform that's another great way to get the word out as well uh, inviting your friends and family to participate that kind of is alluded to in terms of the e-blasts and social media posts, but we hope if people, you know, you're sending this email out to hopefully you can ask them questions or get them directed back to somebody that can answer their questions. And then we'd love to see you on the 24th as well from two to seven is when we're gonna have our open house at the library. Again, you are welcome to stop by. You're not expected to be there for that entire window of time at all. You can participate in whatever fashion you would like, you know, during that meeting as well, uh, but we'd love to see you, you know, be a part of the, the process of that meeting. What is that meeting? So it's an open house format. There's no formal presentation. So the intent is that people can come as they want. There will be stations of activity um, that we will be, that we're currently planning out. So we're again, trying to, that's that learn part of our purpose here is understanding experiences. So we want to know, um, We'll have one activity that we're we're planning out right now is uh, building your ideal house. So we want to know what we'll have a card that you can pick. My ideal house is a an apartment or a single family home or a large lot home. I can go on there and check the different amenities that I'd like to see out of my home. So I want to be um, located near a school. I want it to be energy efficient and sustainable. But I don't care if it is um, but something else. Whatever. Um, and then you'll you'll complete your card and drop it in a location to represent where in the community you'd like to live. Do you want to live in the core? Do you want to live in a new neighborhood? Do you want to live on the fringe of the community? So there are some, it's meant to be tactile and engaging. So people have different, there'll be some beads and stickers and different things. So people can visit the different stations and give us our, their input from that standpoint. Again, trying to understand what experiences people have had with River Falls, and that really helps us understand the issues and opportunities. We're trying to get input that will help us understand what we need to be setting for goals uh, for the next 20 years um, through this process. So who will be manning these stations? Will staff. we be? Oh, not okay. staff. staff. So yep. we just kind of circulate. Yep. And again, if you can only stop by for, for five minutes, you know, whatever time. But if you would love to, if you want to spend five hours with us, you're more than welcome to uh, work. We can definitely put you into work. Wow. <laughs> but conversations with people while you're there, you know, yeah. too, and, you know, help them understand more about the process because you've got this more information and background and foundation a lot of folks do. So help to translate that to sort of where they're at and then bring that feedback back to the groups to kind of conversations with them. And that's a good thing. So having it open that long is helpful for you know, shift workers and mm -hmm. folks can come early and go work after. That's that's good. That's good. That's okay. a Thursday. Question right? about um, yep. posting. So we've got about three or four different unity related um, groups on Facebook. There's you know, River Falls Information, River Falls Community, River Falls this and that. 
is, you know, is it somebody like me, if I wanted to, I could post to those groups, or would you prefer the city have someone officially going and posting, or is it preferred to have it more organic from a planning commissioner their standpoint saying, hey, I just wanted to let the this community group, group know that this is there. My concern is I might not be presenting it properly, but um, I was just looking at some of those other, particularly with Facebook, which I'm more of an observer on Facebook than a poster, but um, that was something that crossed my mind is, and that's where you see a lot of complaints from the public, a certain, in a certain demographic, and some of these groups want to complain about some of the uh, things that the city is doing or they feel they're not engaged, and this addresses that. So I would say typically the city provides its own post, and where it goes from there is organic. Okay, so we so could share that. I would say there are people that read posts, cities posts on the community page. Okay. Um, I think folks kind of watch that within that Facebook community and, mm -hmm. and pick that up. Um, the city nurse and city staff will be pushing that any further past the post. Oh, so yeah. just simply sharing for, for someone like me or anybody else. <laughs> could do that. Mm -hmm. So okay. Yep. Well, the last question I had uh, was related to the, the one that we'll be doing, uh, you know, it's the uh, utilities and community facilities. And I was thinking, you know, we're we're looking at this and we're getting the data from the Department of Administration. The city, uh, you know, Kevin's shop would have a lot of what we're going to get from that piece, right? As far as planning for utilities, it's kind of already templated, right? Or how does it kind of mesh? So I guess one piece of it, we had talked about with this process, if we wanted to include um, like a water wastewater yep. study and decided to just take on these three plans right now. So Kevin is poised. <laughs> As soon as we get, you know, probably halfway through the plan okay. <laughs> and they've started to get the data and the projections that we're pulling out of here, they're going to, you know, start the water wastewater um, study as well to start getting those projections. And I would imagine those already have, are, have some things already in place because my recollection when plans. I was on the commission, it was, we already, we had those kind of things. They're older at this point okay. and they're based on the 2005 plan so wow back when i was like that okay yeah so it, it's a rolling piece once we get the data here then they'll pull from that okay keep going all right yeah thanks so there will be um so again you know again we've got some stuff coming up here this will be a really exciting month our next meeting, which we were thinking was going to be February, but we pushed with COVID will be, we'll have the results from these engagement activities. So the next time that we'll be gathering, we'll be really looking at what, what goals were we looking at in 2030? What has been our guiding vision, um, you know, since 2005 and establishing some new goals. So really, as we're starting to think about this, it's understanding, you know, again, what has been our policy to, to, that we've been using for to make decisions and what changes are we hearing from the public? Where what are some of our focuses are, focus areas? What new emerging things were we not thinking about? What are what are the goals that we want to set? This is a really important part of the process because it's going to then tell us what we want to be analyzing. So I'll bring it back to that housing component with density. If we're, you know, depending on what we're hearing, we might decide that we need to really be thinking about that the need is for higher density develop, development versus kind of the standard of maybe what we've been doing. And so then we need to, that understanding and kind of goal will then set the analysis that we are then going to do in terms of what does that mean for zoning ordinances and, and land use needs and things moving forward. So that's kind of, we're getting to that really, to, start that nerdy part of the planning process when we're getting into some of those those details but our next meeting will be really important in terms of the goal standpoint and so 
We will make sure that you have a summary of the input that we've received prior to our next meeting in the hopes that you're able to look at that and hopefully you've been engaging in engage our app and those kind of things and are, are hearing some things and can bring that input, but really we'll be rolling up our sleeves and working really closely together to talk about what we want for goals. I will note as well that the in terms of our companion plans, they will have their own individual goals within those planning processes. So, and again, they're looking at kind of a different span, a more specific system wide level, but we will want to make sure that the goals established across all three plans complement each other from that standpoint. But we're going to we're going to be higher level than they're going to be in terms of their goals just been based on what the plans are going to do. Um, but there will be some more information, you know, coming out from us. We're also uh, putting together a, a new work. I'm calling it a newsletter, but it'll have a better term or different term that will kind of be a, an update that would go to all three steering committees once a month. So you can just understand what all three plans are have going on and what upcoming dates. The intent, you know, you'll see, maybe see the next date for the bike pad steering committee. It's not something that you have to go to or anything like that. It's just letting you know what's coming up in the process as well. So you, you have that kind of big picture perspective as well. So look out for, for some more information from that. And as always, we're, you know, here for questions and things. So for March, if you would, I, I believe we're going to have um, an item at least one for the March regular plan commission meeting. So plan on that and then also plan on that is a third Thursday, I believe. Yep. We will meet as well. So you're gonna have two meetings in March. Is third Thursday, third? Third Thursday. Mm -hmm. I think we can think about that for the next few months. Um, it's like we're gonna vacations are coming in as we're you know the seasons changing and developments kind of gearing up that one of having separate meetings for So that'll be the that's when the <laughs> March fifteenth, and that'll be that'll be the third. You said Thursday though. Thursday. Third Thursday. Oh third third Patrick's Day. Oh St. Patrick's Day. Okay, I could be back by then. St. Patty's Day. <laughs> you better be having beer and corned beef, otherwise I'll be downtown. <laughs> yeah, <I'm not. laughs> Isn't there going to be some potato soup you're going to have taste for a contest? I don't think that is usually the best job ever. It may not be the best thing to do it. Interesting. <laughs> we can send out a. Uh, that was the the third Thursday was the date that worked best in terms of the poll and trying to you know with the all and other commitments, but if. Um, St. Patrick, you don't want to gather on St. Patrick's Day. We can send out a doodle poll for some other dates around it, just specifically for the, the month of March if, if we want to avoid the, the Irish holiday. So. You, it, just hands. Any who does not want to meet on the 17th? I figured I'd prefer not to if we can change it, but if we can't, I'll come back later. Right? Okay. Also, a so I mean, yeah, it's, it's probably be, it has to be a celebrating a birthday, so a family member, so yeah. Okay, um, we'll take a look at it. And get okay, Jim. Yeah. Sorry for talking so much. I'll try harder next time. One more. I'm gonna get bugged on my way to my bike after this.